on stage. And as John's joining here, so John, John Morian, he's the safety and risk management innovator. Like that is a great, that's a great title. Safety and risk management innovator. Very cool. And well, uh, hopefully I can live up to that. <laughs> bars high. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, you better blow our minds on this one. But we're talking micro learning for safety training. And I'm really looking forward to seeing where you're going to go with this one. So any, uh, any, anything that you want to add to this? Can we get a round of emojis for John before we get going? We got to get fired up here. Feels a little quiet on the emoji front. Haven't seen as many as, as usual. All right. Your slides are ready. John, yep. I will jump in as we get close to the end. And that's, that's your cue that we'll chat for a bit. Everybody, here is John with the awesome title telling us about microlearning with safety training. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Hello, everyone out there. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. So let's jump in and get started. Today, what I'd like to talk about is uh, I'd like to discuss three use cases for microlearning, strategies for getting programs approved, and a systematized approach to lowering injury rates. So my goal here is really just to share some practical ideas. Full disclosure, though, I'm not an L&D professional. What I'll be talking about is not necessarily scientific. It's based on my own experience. I've been in safety and risk management for about 18 years now and only got in tr uh, involved in training uh, several years ago when I worked for an organization that had a really small budget. Um, we've probably all been there at some point. Um, so I started building courses with Google Slides. It's embarrassing how bad they were, and I will not be sharing any of those. Um, rabbit holes. Something I did want to express is I don't really know the experience level of everyone on, at the conference. So I'm going to briefly explain these concepts and safety and try to uh, make sure I, I don't just run over these crazy acronyms. I actually spell out those crazy acronyms we all use in the safety world. So I'm going to start with a few questions. And my first question is, what is micro learning? If I can get the, there we go. Uh, and the second question is what are we trying to accomplish? I always think that's an important question. And I'll get back to the first one in just a minute. I think, you know, whether you're a business owner or a safety manager or L&D manager, L&D person, we're all trying to be understood, right? We're trying to transfer our knowledge to other people, right? And it probably seems obvious that in safety, it's pretty important because this could be the difference between a near miss, whoops, someone almost getting in an accident or incident, and someone being severely injured. And what made me really think about this question is what the question, what is micro learning was when I was researching an episode for my podcast, Let's Not Die Today. And it's totally OK for you to laugh. Uh, it's, it's meant to be a little tongue in cheek. Uh, the website's actually toolboxtalkshow.com. In the simplest terms, the podcast is basically audio versions of safety meetings. But the podcast is really meant to solve a problem. And I love technology, and I think there's all this great technology out there that can really help us solve problems. And the problem with safety meetings is they're terrible. So here's a scenario you're probably all familiar with. Manager runs into to his office, prints out a toolbox talk, which is slang for a safety meeting, hands it to some poor employee and says, hey, in two minutes, would you read this out loud? Now, they don't have any background in public speaking, no background in safety, and through no fault of their own, it sounds like someone reading the directions to a microwave oven. So my goal in safety and, and doing the podcast is to make these safety meetings engaging, a little history to get people interested, some statistics. So it says, hey, this is why it's important to me. And then a few safety tips. And we do this all in about five minutes. So Anyways, back to the podcast research. So I was researching SDS, and SDS just means safety data sheet. It's basically a form that tells you the dangers of a chemical and the precautions you should take when working with it. So what a lot of people don't know is that the modern SDS took about a 1,000 years to develop. Early civilizations discovered dangers of medicines and dyes, and then they passed that information on verbally. And what do the Egyptians have to do with it? Well, they pass the information on through the use of hieroglyphics. Then when written language was developed, this, was, this meant wider use of this information, right? But units of measure weren't standardized. So the ability to transmit that knowledge was still extremely limited. Then came standardized units of measure and the invention of the printing press and all that changed. So really the history of SDS is the history of communication. So you go from the printing press to the telegraph to telephone, radio, TV, internet, smartphone, podcasting, and now we have micro learning. 
a communications platform. And in the next slide, I hope there's some nerds in the audience. Sadly, I can't hear you guys so you could laugh. Um, for any of those who don't know, uh, this is what I thought of the first time I ever took or created a micro learning class. And for those of you who don't know, this is The Matrix. It's a film that came out in 1999 starring Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss. And in this scene, Carrie Ann Moss needs to learn how to fly a helicopter. And that's her operator tank. And watch, wait, wait, there's the helicopter. He is going to load that information directly into her brain, right? Pretty cool. So I always thought about that when I thought, when I, the first time I ever uh, created a micro learning course, I was like, wow, this is almost like The Matrix, right? So on to the next slide, on to business. So let's talk use cases. So the first use case I'd like to talk about is remedial training. And remedial training uh, in safety, there are a couple triggers for remedial training. Anytime anyone is observed in an unsafe act or has an incident, we don't call it an accident in safety because there are no accidents, this could trigger remedial training. And let me quickly explain the three basic actions that should follow an incident. Anytime you have an incident, you perform an investigation, you do a root cause analysis, and you provide corrective actions. So it's what happened, why it happened, and what are we going to do about it? It's what we will do about it. So it's how we'll actually address that situation. So anytime you have an incident, corrective actions are the way as an organization we address the issue. And there's some important reasons we do this. Number one, we want to prevent reoccurrence. Pretty important, right? If someone's injured, we don't want another person to get injured for the very same reason. We also want to make it clear, and this is really important for organizations, that to the stakeholders, the employees, OSHA and insurance carriers, that, hey, we have an appropriate response system in place. Very important. So why is micro learning so perfect for remedial training? Well, the goal of remedial training is so that we reinforce safe work practices with employees. And micro learning allows us to do some really cool things, four really cool things. Number one, it can be very specific. We don't have to try to find some generic course, right? It can be distributed quickly. No finding a class, signing someone up. It eliminates all that kind of process. It isn't time consuming. We can quickly build the course. We can quickly distribute it. And the employee can quickly complete it, right? Everyone wins. And the fourth part is the tracking and accountability. And that's always important. So let me give you just a, a very quick example of how we actually use this at one of the organizations I worked with. So we had a, a, a driver go out to a job site. And forgive me, I can't remember the specifics of the situation. He either ran into or over something. And one of the requirements is to do a 360 walk around. And that 360 walk around is really important. It's basically a job site hazard assessment. So after we did our root cause analysis and we did our corrective actions, I told the manager, I said, hey, look, I've got this really cool new tool. I want to try it out. I said, I'm going to build a job site hazard assessment course. I'll send it to you, let you take a look at it, and I'll send it to the employer. Worked brilliantly for this because we could address the specific issue we were having with the employee and the manager, the ops team, they love it. It's not like I was asking to pull them out of their job for four hours and have them sit in a class and for some extended period of time or something like that. It was quick and it was efficient. And it's just a beautiful way to use micro learning. Use case number two. And I'm sorry if I'm going a little fast, guys, but I got a lot to cover. So use case number two, compliance training. Don't you love the Internet? I found this picture and I said, wow, this is the exact expression people make when they have to take uh, their compliance training. It's the exact expression I've probably made uh, when I had to take the compliance training. And I might have even been involved in developing that training. OK, so let's talk about OSHA very quickly, because I always get this question about what OSHA requires and making sure we're compliant with that and all that. So it's a very easy strategy here. Do your research, right? Look up the standards. Here's a publication that OSHA uh, uh, releases. It's called Training Requirements and OSHA Standards. Pretty simple, right? It's 300 pages. So what you have to do is you just have to find the standard you're looking for and flip through. And we're going to look at some examples here. So let's go to emergency planning. If you scroll down uh, page five, page six, you get to training. And I highlight it. It's one line. It's one line. That's it. So in this case, it's not super specific, right? So you do have some leeway, but let's look at another example. And this is powered platforms. So this goes on for three pages. So they give you a little bit more guidance. It's simple, just look up the standard and make sure you're teaching to that standard and you'll be fine. Um, maybe we can do a better job about, uh, about the compliance training in other areas though. 
But before we get to it, and I've got an idea of how we can make uh, the training just a little bit better. Before we do that, I'm going to go through my complaint list. So here's John's complaint list. Do the safety need a reboot or what? So here's my issue with most of the safety training modules we have today. Number one, the narrator puts you to sleep. I mean, who is this guy? It's almost like he's on every safety training video. It's like five seconds to listen to this person. I want to go take a nap. Problem number two, rehashing content from decades ago. All right, so this picture I took from, and I don't know where I got it. Someone sent it to me within the last couple of years. This was part of a PowerPoint. It was obvious somebody went in and took a screenshot from 1975. Look at the guy's sideburns, right? So we rehash content. Why couldn't we go and get a picture of a modern worker working at a machine shop, right? That's not that hard. And then the last thing is no thought put into design. And I don't know if any of you out there have read the book, um, The Design of Everyday Things. And sorry, forgive me. I can't remember the, uh, the, the author's name. But the book goes on for hundreds of pages ranting about how poorly things today are designed. But then he does spend quite a bit of time at the end there telling us ways in which we, could, we can make it better. But it's a great book. It's a, it's, it's, it's a great read. So here's the big idea. Run parallel programs. And this is a much easier sell. If you go to your company and you say, you know what? I know you spent $100,000 on compliance training or some crazy number, right? Let's throw all that out. We're all in on micro learning. They may throw you out. Probably not a good career move. But if you say, hey, let's start with a program that runs parallel, you might get that approved. And then who knows? Maybe you can even get rid of that crusty old compliance training or at least improve it a little bit. So let me give you an example of how we implemented this at one of the organizations I worked with. So we had an external survey of employees and we asked him about training and an employee stated that he was never trained on something. But we had the reports showing he was like we knew he was trained on this. And I don't think the employee was being dishonest. It's just that compliance training is so forgettable. So our team got approval to produce and distribute two micro learning courses a month over the full year. Right. So my, my view is the consistency of taking classes over a period of time just makes a lot more sense. Right. I think so. And there's two things, too, I think we need, to, we need to focus on or think about. And that's compliance training is ineffective. And I think we know that, right? We sit people down once a year. We cram all this stuff in and we say, hey, you're good for 12 months. And, you know, I hope you don't forget it. But it's obvious they're not remembering it. It's not effective. But now we have the tools to fix that. And the big problem here is we have an increased risk of employee injury because we have employees who don't remember their training. So micro learning, another perfect use case uh, for making compliance training uh, a lot better. So let's go to use case number three. And this is for SOPs. For any of you out there who don't know, an SOP is a standard operating procedure. And a standard operating procedure is a set of written procedures for a task that outlines the safest and the most efficient method for completing that task. And it's not just safety, but it's also efficiency. And this will help you sell it to the ops, folks. Let's just be honest. If you take, say, um, 10 minutes a day, you save 10 minutes on one task. You do that task 10 times a day and you have 100 locations. We'll just do the math. It's not hard to figure out that doing it this way, uh, having an SOP means more efficient operations. It also means safer operations. So how do we get to an SOP? Well, one of the ways we can do that is through a JSA, another acronym, sorry, Job Safety Analysis. And this is just a form. You can find these forms online. But it's basically a step-by-step -step analysis of the task. But, guys, there's a big problem with the SOPs, right? It's kind of like SDSs. Let's just be honest about this. So no one reads them. No one reads them. They should, but they don't. I, I did this kind of work for insurance companies for years. I can't tell you how many times I sat down with the manager and said, hey, where's your MSDS uh, booklet or binder? At, back in the day, they printed it out, and it was called um, Material Safety Data Sheets. And they'd say, oh, it's over in the corner somewhere. So you'd walk over there, and it was like, you know, 10 years of dust, no one had touched it, right? Well, SOPs are the same way. Employees aren't reading them. So we need to figure out a different way. So here's the big idea. Put a QR code on it at the bottom of the SOP. So the employee can take a 90 second class and they get all the highlights, right? Think about like a graph, right? When you go and you read a graph, it's so much easier than looking through, you know, paragraphs of text. Um, you can actually absorb the information far quicker. Let's do the same thing for, for uh, SOPs. Let's reinvent SOPs. And I'll tell you, honestly, I don't believe 
that we've even scratched the surface for what we can do from microlearning. One other thing, too, before I move on to, to the last section is I did want to talk about getting things done. This is really important in, in organizations. I've worked in organizations where the budgets, you know, sometimes weren't very good. Sometimes they were bigger. Sometimes there was obstacles to getting things approved. Well, I found through the 18 years of doing this that there are some strategies that can help us get approval, right? So one of the things I'm a big fan of is create a pilot program. This is so much easier, right? The, the bar is so much lower because you can say, hey, we've got this one problem at this one location. Let's, let's run a pilot program, right? That's an easy sell. So number one, it's the lower bar. It's an easier sell. You, you're more likely to get it done. And number two, if you can roll it out company-wide, well, you've worked out all the bugs, right? So you've had a chance to figure out as you go along what works in that program and what doesn't. The second thing is build a course. Right. So if you build a course, send it out to people, particularly influential people. That's what I did to, to have one um, uh, one of my organizations I worked with adopt seven taps is I just simply sent out courses to influential people. And if you want the magic, here's the magic. Send out these send out the QR code to their uh, company email. They'll open it up on their laptop. Don't, don't put anything in the email. Like, oh, check this out. This is the best thing ever, blah, blah, blah. Explain, don't explain anything. Just tell them, scan the QR code. You'll get a phone call in five minutes. They will call you and be like, where did you get this? What is this? We need this. That's the easiest sell in the world. So build a course, build that prototype, send it out, test it out, and, and, and see how things go. All right. So lastly, uh, I want to talk about lowering injury rates. So this is actually, the rest of this is a slide presentation I put together for an organization. And this is basically the last 18 years of experience. This is the last 18 years of my life and where I tried to systematize what we've done over the years to effectively reduce injury rates. And I'll tell you, doing this, there was a 77% uh, reduction in the OSHA incident rate. Uh, one one uh, organization, 80% reduction in, or 83% reduction in workers' comp. And then in another organization, there was a 90% uh, reduction in insurance costs over all lines. So, and it's basically just a six step, uh, six steps that an organization should go through to really manage the risk. And so I came up with an acronym, like safety needs another acronym, right? So this is a, a maxim and I had to use the A. So here we go. A maxim just means a simple truth, right? I love simplicity. And it means analysis, master plan, alignment, very important. X factor, my favorite part. We'll talk about that in a minute. Implementation or implement and measure. And all these are just really the most important things you need to remember when you're trying to address these situations at a company. So let's let's look at um, analysis. So what are the issues? Uh, what are the risks to the organization? What are the injuries or incidents we've had in the past? And what are the hazards that employees are exposed to? This is very important you get the analysis right. And honestly, I was going to skip this uh, slide, but I'm going to go ahead and explain it to you. Many times I'm told, hey, we have an issue at the, our organization. It's injuries. We're having injuries. And I will tell them, no, you don't have. That's not your issue, right? That is the symptom, not the disease. I'll guarantee you it's either a risk management issue or it's an organizational issue. It's a deeper issue. It's one of the two. So don't really have time to explain any more about that, but you get the point. All right. So the master plan, this is very simple and straightforward. Once you've identified your problems, you need to have goals and initiatives. This is how we're going to address them as a company. They need to be underpinned by policies and procedures. Policy say, as a company, this is what we're going to do. And procedures say, this is how we're going to do them. The next thing is alignment. This is very important. Uh, you know, a lot of times we talk about employee buy-in. Oh, we need employee buy-in. And employee buy-in is important. But alignment is so much more than that. We need to get everyone in the organization pulling in the same direction. So this is leadership. This is management. This is employees. Um, you know, it makes me think about when I was a kid, we had field day. I don't know if they do that anymore. And you'd be on the tug of war team and you'd not want to lose. You didn't want to lose, right? Because if everybody wasn't pulling in unison, you would get dragged across the ground through the mud and the grass and everything else. It's not fun. I don't even think you probably allow this anymore. Anyways, so what you want to do is bring on your cheerleaders. Make sure that leadership and management is very visible and supporting the change to the organization. You want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. You want to influence uh, and nudge people in the right direction. I love the, the first talk uh, where, the, where uh, Mo was talking about uh, nudge theory. Fantastic. We want to get individuals 
going in that right direction. And there's a second part to this, and that's communication and messaging. The messaging must be clear and concise, must be consistent. It must be relatable, and it's in all things, emails, memos, training. You've got to be the, you've got to be consistent. X Factor, my favorite part. There is so much technology out there. It's absolutely amazing. You can do so much with so little today. And half the time, there's free versions of stuff. Uh, technology creates efficiencies, improves your results. Gain, it'll help you gain traction quickly. And there's all kinds of technology. Safety management software, we'll talk about that in a second. Trello, Hemingway app, and, of course, micro learning, right? All right, so let me quickly tell you about SMS. I'm going to flip through this. You can automate your safety meetings, your work observations, all these things and safety inspections, audits, and onboarding. And so it just makes for a nice addition if you can use an SMS. It makes your life so much, so much easier. Uh, let's see here. All right. And then a lot of them even have, uh, you know, mobile apps. And you can do, like, real-time reporting, stuff like that. Pretty fantastic. So I like Trello for, and there's a free version of Trello. I like Trello for mapping out, hey, these are the initiatives, and this is what we're going to do step by step. So very helpful. Um, this is the Hemingway app, and I love it because if you paste some text in here, it will tell you what level of education is required to comprehend that text, and that's really important. It's actually the medical industry. Their gold standard is a seventh grade level for two reasons. Number one, maximum reach. Number two, people with higher education levels can grasp the concepts quicker. So pretty important in medicine. Why should safety be any different, right? So um, seven taps, again, use a QR code. Oh, my God, that's, that's the way to go. Um, it's magic. So a couple of features uh, for seven taps I always focus on is the simple distribution when I'm talking to companies about it and the no passwords. Oh my God, make people's lives easy, right? Simplify. All right. And I only have two more slides, so I'll move through those very quickly. I know I'm probably getting close on time here, but there's five things you want to do when you go to implement and you have to get this right. And I'll give you an example of where I was in an organization. We got it wrong. Number one, you have to set clear expectations. You have to identify barriers and coach those folks. You have to reduce friction. Very important. I'll talk about that in a second. You have to make sure there's accountability and incentives and disciplines are aligned with what you're doing. So I'll give you an example of an epic fail. I was part of an organization. We rolled out a checklist, basically, form uh, for onboarding, right? It was clunky. It, did, it was confusing. It was floating around in PDF documents. Nobody knew what to do, how to do it. A year later, no one was doing it, right? It was a complete failure. So what we did to fix that was we built that form into our SMS, our safety management software. We made the whole process frictionless. It was easy. It was convenient. And guess what? People started doing it. And we could track it so we could hold people accountable. All right, last slide here uh, is measurement. And this is so important. You want a feedback loop. First thing you want to look at is your leading indicators. This is looking out the front windshield. You want to take a look at um, leading indicators such as JSOs, job safety observations, near miss reporting, JSAs, job safety analysis. And you, know, you can build these in as your KPIs. These are these proactive measures you're taking to create a safer uh, workforce. Your lagging indicators, very important, but it's rear view. TRIR, that's your total recordable incident rate. That's your OSHA rate. Your experience mod, that's uh, your, your workers' comp experience mod. And very quickly, oversimplified, if you have claims, your experience mod goes up, you pay more for insurance. If you don't have claims, it goes down, and you pay less for insurance. Pretty much that simple. Um, and then loss runs, that's just your claim history. So you want to use all that as part of your trend analysis and then use that as a basis for continual improvement. And then it's just a matter of starting the whole process over, analysis, and just going through it all over again. But this is the way to effectively analyze your risk and then manage it. So um, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I have had a great time. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. And uh, I'm open for any questions. Awesome. Well, thanks, John, for all that you shared on this one. Um, again, I think you're your approach is extremely helpful for folks and, and lots of emojis coming in. Let's get another round of emojis for John and all he shared. And he'll be, all the content will be available afterwards. So the questions of, hey, will I be able to reference back to this? John, I'm assuming the answer to that is an absolute yes. Um, sure. On there. Awesome. Well, you know what? We 